Okay, we're going to begin. Uh, welcome to our um, June uh, IHE Lunch and Learn. Uh, today we have the honor to hear from Dr. Mark Gudgel, who is a secondary education teacher at North High School here in Omaha. And mm. Mark is also a, uh, holds a uh, an, uh, master's degree and doctorate. And Mark, are you still, are you still at Nebraska Wesleyan as an adjunct professor or? Yeah, and, yeah, I'm all, I, I didn't this spring, but I'll go back and I'm not teaching in the summer, but I'll be back this fall teaching wonderful. undergrad actually. Which oh, is okay, great. and Mark is also was a finalist for teacher of the year in Nebraska. Uh, he's a Fulbright scholar and a fellow of the United States Holocaust Museum and Imperial War Museum. He's devoted his career to teaching uh, social justice and civil rights. And when he's not teaching, he's an avid runner, writes poetry, a wine blog, various essays, coaches cross country. He has a wife and two beautiful children. Um, Mark is also the author of a book to be published on the 16th of October called Think Higher, Feel Deeper, Effective, the Effectively Nuancing the Holocaust in Secondary Classrooms. And Mark is also going to be a presenter at a workshop that we're doing for teachers uh, with, uh, with uh, UNL Beth is also going to be part of that in October, so we're very excited, and I want to turn it out over to Mark now. If everybody would please mute themselves if we didn't get to you, and uh, enjoy. Well, Scott, thank you. Sorry, there was a huge crash outside my office door. <laughs> um, thank you for that. Um, I always wonder where people are finding biographies of me because they all say different things. <laughs> I, I Googled and put a couple of them together. <laughs> it's, and it was it's too long, but it was pretty good. Um, <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, it's really great to, to have the chance to be here with you. And I'm honored you took the time to come today. I am admittedly uh kind of notoriously so, uh long-winded and so i'm i've given myself some pretty concise notes uh that i'm going to allow myself to work from and then uh, i'm going to share a couple of very brief passages from the book that i've selected and uh my hope is that we'll have a lot of time for questions and that that something i say might might inspire some questions um but, uh, you know, to begin with, I just wanted to say, again, thank you. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for, you know, investing, um, you know, time into, into topics like this one. Not everybody does. And I, I, maybe that's stating the obvious, but it's, it's equally true. Not everybody is, is doing this right now, clearly. And um, so I'm really glad to get to talk to you a little bit about Holocaust education and, and about my book uh, that's coming out this fall. Um, so maybe to begin with, you know, how I, I wanted to touch on how I came to the Holocaust, how I came to studying about and, and teaching about the Holocaust. And, and it was a journey that, um, you know, is still taking place. Um, I'm not Jewish, uh, but I, I, of course, that's one of the very first questions that, uh, students will often ask me and sometimes colleagues and, and others as well. Um, to me, it was one of those things that, you know, the topic of the Holocaust was not taught very effectively. Now, I'm from a small town, and, and I think I had good teachers. I know I had well-intended teachers, and I think they were relatively good teachers. Um, some of them were excellent, obviously, some better than others. But, you know, I, I don't think that this is a topic that was ever uh, really mined for me and maybe maybe that was by design uh the more i look back you know the, the more i look at our current system of education i think the more troubled i become um a lot of this is coming out now you're seeing a lot of pushback on critical race theory you're seeing you know we've known for an awful long time that the uh state of texas very effectively manipulates the content of textbooks there's some of that in my book actually um and a number of other things. And it's not, I don't mean to demonize Texas either, you know, it's not exclusively they're doing. Um, but, you know, I don't think I got a very good education when it come to, came to 
to the topic of the Holocaust. And so a lot of it was self-exploration. Um, I, had, I had friends in college who were learning about it and talking about it. And I, I had a professor in college who uh, was very interesting. Um, and, and then shortly after taking my first teaching job, I met Lou Leviticus. Um, a survivor, uh, he's, he was Dutch, um, but lived in Lincoln. I think, I wanna say maybe he came to, to, to Omaha, pardon me, to Lincoln in, in I think 1975 to work at the university. He ran the tractor lab. Um, and he, he and his wife Rose became very good friends of mine. Um, and that was sort of, that, that was a part of it. And another part of it was teaching a course on the literature of the Holocaust, which had been, um, had been uh, made available, you know, but had, wasn't taught at the school I was teaching at. And so it was an opportunity that I took. Um, part of it was opportunities to study at the Anti-Defamation League and at the IHE who's hosting us today. And Beth was a big part of that journey. Um, it was really cool to see you. Uh, funny, quick side note, Beth, but when, uh, when uh, I got a phone call from Scott earlier in the week, uh, it said that it was you. And what I realized is that probably 15 years ago, I programmed the IHE's number into my phone as, as Beth. <laughs> and so I was like, what the, uh, why, well, you know, it was great that Beth's calling me. Why is Beth calling me? Um, you weren't, but, <laughs> uh, but Scott and I got to talk. And another part of it, you know, Sandy was actually uh, a big part of that journey as well. And, and um, you know, she and I and, and Paul Smith and many others helped to put together the Nebraska Holocaust Education Consortium early on. Um, and, and we did some crazy things. Um, at, at one point in time, uh, Paul Smith, Sandy, myself, and uh, oh gosh, Sandy, was that Pam Gannon? There was one other person with us. I think it might've been Pam. Um, we uh, flew to North Carolina to the eastern part of the state, rented a car, drove it back across the state of North Carolina, which is deceptively long if you're looking at a map, and uh, wound up at, at Appalachian State University, which is this little mountain town in rural North Carolina, but hosts this incredible symposium on Holocaust education. And you know, they, I, I remember emailing them and they were like, you're from Nebraska, you wanna come? Sure, you can come. And, and we went and we met Robert Jan von Pelt, right? The, the guy who <laughs> snuck back, you know, into to Soviet occupied Poland and retrieved blueprints from the gas chambers at Auschwitz. Uh, we met Michael Bierenbaum, the, one of the founding directors of the Holocaust Museum in DC. Um, and we met a woman named Miriam Kasanov, Klein Kasanov, whose story actually is uh, a really important part of one of the chapters uh, in my book, and we won't dig too deep into that chapter today, but, you know, all of these things kind of came together and, and pulled me into this field. I attended the Belfer Conference in, uh, in uh, boy, 2000 and maybe six, something like that, the Arthur and Rochelle Belfer Conference for Holocaust Educators, and uh, there I met Damascus Simba, who I later worked with in Rwanda for years and years and years, um, and, and a number of other people. But I remember, you know, I, I was a brand new teacher when I went to that, and I remember calling my mom, you know, and of course I've, I've graduated from college and I have a job, but I want to go to this conference in D.C., and I don't, either they weren't offering the scholarships at that time, or I didn't get one, or I didn't, you know, know about it, or whatever, so I called mommy and asked for money to go to this conference, and, you know, bless her, my mother was like, sure, how much is it, and of course I told her it cost twice as much as it did, and, um, <laughs> you know, uh, but, uh, you know, without that, I, I just, I don't know. I, I don't, you know, all of these things, all these incredible experiences, um, which many of you were part of, are, are really the foundation for this book. Um, and it all culminated about two years ago. I was at a workshop at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, um, where Father Dubois and, and um, his group were doing a workshop on ho the Holocaust by bullets. And I don't, know what the impetus for this was but for some reason I was sitting there listening and I started to uh, I started to write uh, the outline of a book 
I thought if I was going to write a book about Holocaust education, what would be in it? And unlike previous experiences I'd had outlining some other books, it came together really well. And I went, oh, well, that actually, that, that would be an interesting book. And so I saved it and tucked it away and went back about my business. And then, of course, last year, right in the spring of 2020, we're on spring break. And uh, then we, you know, I think it was the Sunday of spring break, get a phone call and we're told, don't come back for a week. And I'll never forget how foolishly excited I, as a 30 something year old man was about that. Like I was old enough that I probably should have known better, but that my reaction was, oh my gosh, spring break is now two weeks long. Fantastic, right? I think I had no idea what was coming and, and maybe to be fair to myself, I think probably very few of us did. Um, but as soon as we realized that was not a one week, you know, thing, I took that outline out and I thought, okay, I'm gonna write this book. And so for the next three months, I woke up at four o'clock in the morning and I wrote for four hours straight. And um, it came together incredibly quickly. I fired it off to uh, four different presses, two, two good academic publishers, my dream publisher, which is Teachers College Press from Columbia University. And uh, one that I thought, boy, if they don't take it, it really is not a good book. And um, they all took it. So I, of course I went with Teachers College Press and it, it, it is, Scott mentioned earlier, it comes out in October. That's kind of the, the story, the, the short-ish version of how all this came to be. Um, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about just the title of the book, why it's called what it is, and then we will uh, look at, at just three of the chapters very, very briefly together, and then hopefully have time for, for quite a few questions if there are any. Um, before that, though, I do, I want to acknowledge somebody, I, I don't really, I try not to read the chat while I'm talking because I don't walk and chew gum very well, but I did notice it was, it was Beth, I think, yeah, who remembered it was Sydney who was with us um, out in, in North Carolina, and now, of course, I remember that perfectly, but thank you for that. Um, so, excuse me, believe it or not, this is my first cup of coffee today. I, um, I met with my doctor a few weeks ago and I said, I, she said, why are you here? I have a new physician. And, and I said, I don't want to die young. And she said, well, we're going to need to change some things. And so uh, my caffeine intake is high on that list. So this is my first cup of coffee, whereas normally by now I'd be on like pot number two. Um, at any rate, uh, think higher, feel deeper. I have come to find out is something that Elie Wiesel said to a number of people. Um, at the beginning of my book, though, I tell a story that I'll condense for you now. I, I met Elie Wiesel. I reached out to him and asked him uh, if I could republish, reprint his Nobel Prize acceptance speech once, and he said, sure. We sort of became pen pals, and he always wrote short handwritten notes on his Boston University letterhead. I have one of those hanging in my classroom, um, and so I, I would of course, write back to him handwritten notes. And we did this for years. And um, he at one point said, well, you should, should come out. I'm giving a lecture at the 92nd Street Y. You should come out to, to New York. And I said, I'd love to. Could I, could I bring some students? He said, sure, how many? He said, I, I don't know, like five. I'll ask how many want to go. He said, sure, five's good. Uh, when, when I got that back from him, I went to my literature, the Holocaust class. I said, would anybody like to fly to New York and meet Ellie Wiesel? It's probably gonna be pretty expensive, but we could fundraise, you know. Every hand went up. And so I got back to him and I said, did I say five? I meant 25. And he said, that's not a problem. So, you know, months later, 25 of us fly to New York to the 92nd Street Y, hear him speak, go to the Museum of Jewish Heritage, did a few other things while we were in the city. And then we proceeded to do that for the next five years. And um, at one point, uh, Professor Wiesel, I think I have a, yeah. 
I don't know if it was, this is the worst photograph in terms of like its quality, but at one point he, we would always, we'd meet in the side chamber of the, of the uh, uh, 92nd Street Y and he took my hand and he says to me, from one teacher to another, thank you. And that was the most moving thing I've ever experienced possibly. It was definitely right up there. Um, and on the flight home, this question lodged itself in my brain. And rather than send it back to him in a letter, I thought I, I need to ask him that question in person. So I held on to this question all year long. And when we went back out again the following year, and he spoke to my students and he signed all their books and, and uh, it was great. I mean, he had this way of making kids feel as if he was there to see them, you know? And, and it was just really fantastic. Well, it, at the end, we're shaking hands again. And, and um, I, I got to ask this question that I've been carrying around for a year. I said, what advice do you have for me as a teacher? And he pauses for just a second. And I, I know you can all hear his voice. I know you've all heard him speak before. And he just said, think higher, feel deeper. And then he dropped the mic and walked off. He didn't say anything else. That was it. <laughs> and, and if I'm not mistaken, that was the last time I ever saw him in person. And I have been trying my best to take that advice ever since. Um, and so that is the that is kind of the driving idea behind this book, and what I really have attempted to do in the in it is to offer advice to teachers that I think I wish I had gotten or things I wish I knew. You know, I've drawn from a lot of mistakes that I've made and things that I learned maybe later than I wish I had and tried to compile that into something that I hope is very readable. I wrote the book in the first person. I, I did not get on publishers' web pages and find out what they wanted. I did what I knew they didn't want and kind of dared them not to publish it. And I got really lucky. Um, and so I, I wrote this book in the first person. It's extremely conversational. At least one scholar I respect has outright told me he can't stand it. He's like, it doesn't sound academic. And, and a lot of you probably know this scholar, so I'm not going to tell you who it is, but I, I, as, as politely as possible was like, yeah, that's the point. Unlike your books, people will read this. Um, but, or at least that's my hope. Um, so there's three topics I thought we'd dig into just really briefly today um, from three different chapters. And I'm going to read you just a short excerpt from each and kind of discuss that chapter and then, and then we'll move on. Okay. So the first comes from the second chapter, and I'm going to be actually, I don't have a paper copy of this book yet, so I'm going to be scrolling through a Word doc. I hope you'll forgive me. Um, but uh, the second chapter of the book is called The Paradox of Education, and um, I'm just going to read you a few quick paragraphs here to introduce that idea. All right. I have often heard it suggested most often in implication by students, teachers, parents, educational stakeholders, that the study of the Holocaust somehow makes students into better people. I strongly disagree. Sure, the study of certain aspects of the Holocaust can help mold and shape people in desirable ways, can impact their thinking and their worldview, but I might liken studying the Holocaust to the health benefits of eating a steak. An eight ounce sirloin should have around 60 grams of protein in it, far more than any reasonable protein shake, far more than you need in one sitting and without all the additives. Eating such a steak could be good for your health, depending on how much you exercise, what else you eat and drink, your cholesterol level and myriad other factors. It could also contribute to obesity, be bad for your already ailing heart or make you ill again, depending upon the context. So it is with studying the Holocaust. I never want kids or their parents or anyone else to think that this study is some sort of therapy, some misguided form of self-help. True, studying the Holocaust can help us be grateful for what we have, 
may inspire activism, help build empathy, and many other things that we might deem desirable. But it doesn't do that by itself. If that is happening in your classes, you're the one doing it. And you probably already knew that. In searching for answers about how the Holocaust could have occurred, students are sometimes drawn to the erroneous idea that the Germans of the period must have somehow been of lesser intelligence. What follows in this chapter is an examination of what I have come to call the paradox of education. These are examples from the Holocaust of the intersection of evil and intellect, and they stand as evidence that being educated or intelligent is not the same thing as being good. I have said repeatedly to anyone who will listen that if we insist upon educating young people in literacy, numeracy, science, and technology, at the expense of teaching things like critical thinking, reasoning, empathy, and compassion, then all we are doing is building weapons. If we can help our students to see that there is no connection between a keen intellect and a moral compass, then perhaps we can help them to develop both. So that is the lead in to the second chapter of the book. And then it goes on to draw from examples that I hope teachers can use um, and others perhaps as well. We look at the Einsatzgruppen. Um, there were four Einsatz units, three of them led by people with a PhD. Um, we look at the Vansay conference, right? January the 20th, 1942, um, when 15 high ranking Nazi officials, uh, all of them men, uh, chaired by General Reinhard Heydrich, um, sat down and outlined the quote unquote final solution to the Jewish question. Half of those men had doctorates. Um, and, uh, you know, we look at uh, the Nuremberg trials, right, and uh, the major war criminals trials and, and the, the, the astronomical IQs of the men on trial there. Um, you know, with the exception of Julius Stryker, you know, who, who was of completely average intelligence as far as his IQ is concerned. Um, you know, with the lone exception of Julius Stryker, they were, were all of nearly genius level as, you know, if, if you buy into the whole IQ thing, which I doubt, but it's a separate issue. And so, you know, part of this chapter or most of this chapter really looks, you know, uses examples drawn from the Holocaust, but looks at, at the idea that you know, simply learning these things unto themselves is not going to turn you into a better human being, right? There, there are other things that we have to be working on there, uh, other steps that have to be taken. And so um, I, I try to repeat that line about building weapons as often as I can. Um, if you look at our school, I teach a course on, on, uh, on uh, world religions right now. And that course, uh, they tried to cancel it this year. Uh, fortunately, a few people went to bat for me. I won't be at all surprised if it's canceled next year. Um, my humanities class, in which I teach about the Holocaust and 20th century genocides, is probably uh, somewhere near the chopping block uh, because of our extreme emphasis on pathways and STEM in my school. Um, you know, we will build robots from dawn to dusk, which is a great thing to know how to do, you know, but as soon as I start teaching critical thinking, you know, someone's going to object about something, you know, uh, do they really need to, you know, and so I think um, as we look at the current state of education, and, and especially as we look at um, people seeking to defund public education through voucher programs, um, and, and the ever increasing push for charter schools. Um, you know, there, there's a relationship here. There, there are, there's, uh, I think it's extremely important that uh, we maintain in our school systems, uh, you know, that we continue to teach, you know, not only critical thinking, but, uh, you know, you can build empathy. You can learn empathy. I was not born empathetic and, uh, you know, my wife is in the next room and she can tell you I am not always empathetic, uh, but we can learn how to be, right? And, and we can teach how to be. And I think that's every bit as important as, um, you know, the mechanics of writing, which is also something I teach. 
you know, and, and kind of on that in that vein, before we move on here, you know, one of the other things, I guess, is that, uh, you know, it's, it's 2021, right? Uh, we all, I think about the computers that I used in high school. I think about the computers I used in college. I mean, I'm sitting at my desk now with this, this little folding computer. And I mean, this, this phone of mine has infinitely more power than the most powerful computer at the University of Nebraska when I attended in undergrad less than 20 years ago. Um, it, it, why would I ask you to memorize a date? You will never be in a situation in which you cannot push a button and ask your phone what day that happened. But what caused that event to happen, right? What happened before it? What happened after it? Why that happened? Those are the things that I think don't maybe appear in those, those stale old textbooks that we need to make sure as teachers we're always emphasizing. So that's the second chapter of the book. I'm going to share a very short passage from the eighth chapter of the book, which draws largely from my doctoral dissertation. It's called Images Still and Moving. If you'll give me just a second to, to pull this up. Um, as I'm scrolling through a Word document on my computer, very professional presenter I am. Um, it's, uh, let me see here. This is this uh, short, short passage is, is a great idea from one of my colleagues, uh, who some of you surely know, not from, not from me. But it, it was one of the most, as I was doing my doctoral research on how we use film to teach about the Holocaust, it was one of the most compelling things I had ever heard. And I think flies in the face of at least some conventional wisdom or some some recent approaches to teaching about the Holocaust. I think a lot of us, you know, if you look at the guidelines from the Holocaust Museum and things, a, a lot of us have, have kind of had this idea for a long time, but um, this is to do with how we use images to teach. And I'm just going to share a short little passage. Um, a colleague of mine, a teacher from California, once put it to me in a way that I will never forget when she shared what a rabbi of hers had once told her. So now I'm quoting her. A friend of mine, a rabbi who was born in Bergen-Belsen shortly after the war, has argued that many of the victims of the Holocaust were highly observant Jews for whom modesty was a profound value. They would never have allowed themselves to be seen in the nude. My friend argues that we should respect their wishes in death as in life. Thus, I have removed all photographs of disrobed victims from my teaching on this topic, whether in primary source photographs or cinema. Uh, as an interesting side note, when my editor at Teachers College Press read this, uh, she followed up and she said, this is a really important point. Should we also dig into the fact that is, you know, it's never ethical to share a nude photograph of any person who has not agreed to this. And I, I thought that she had a good point. I wasn't sure that it, it fit the book. And I don't even remember what decision was made there in the end. I don't have the book in front of me, like I said, uh, the final draft that is. But, you know, whether it's, it's Schindler's List, which is by far and away the most popular film for teaching about the Holocaust, um, I could tell you all kinds of stories about that. There, there was some debate about that until I did the research. I'm actually very proud of this. I, <laughs> I researched what films teachers were using. And prior to that, we were operating on an awful lot of assumptions. And it turned out many of them were not accurate. Um, so anyway, uh, Schindler's List is used by north of 30% of classroom teachers um, in the United States right now, um, as of 2019, that is. Uh, that's actually farther north than it was in 2015. But anyway, um, whether it's Schindler's List or documentaries by even by the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, um, Oprah's documentary uh, where she interviews Elie Wiesel is, is quite popular among classroom teachers, um, but contains some shocking images that are, you know, really, I, I love Oprah, I'll preface this that way, but there is no lead in for that. There is no... Uh, there's no warning, there's no nothing. It's just shocking. And I, I do think that, you know, I, I've certainly heard over the years as I've hosted a lot of workshops and worked with teachers and, and, and worked at the Holocaust Museum as a rec for six years, um, heard an awful lot of people 
kind of uh, prof profess the idea that, you know, well, but it happened, so it's okay for students to see it. And some have even articulated it differently. Some have said things like, uh, I, know, I know I've done my job if my students leave crying. And uh, politely, I find that horrifying. Um, you know, I, I don't want to tell that teacher to quit teaching, but I would really love for them to make some immediate adjustments to what they're doing and maybe why. Um, I think in the case of these images, the point made by the rabbi um, is, is as obvious as it is profound, you know, um, no, I, I don't want those images shared of me. And I, I don't know that as a, as a high school English teacher, I get to say, well, but this is for posterity or this is for education. No, it's still a human being, you know, or, or many of them. Um, and I think that's extremely important for us to remember. So that's one, one part of that chapter on uh, images, again, still and moving. And then the last one I'll leave you with, I wanna share um, a passage and, and share an idea. And this actually, I'm giving, I'm giving a talk at Royal Wooden Bassett Academy tomorrow, which is, is in England, but I'm doing it this way. So I don't have to go catch a flight or anything, which is frankly uh, disappointing. I love England, but um, this, this is actually, this next part I'm going to share uh, is from chapter 10, which is called Go There. And it's going to be a part of, um, part of my talk tomorrow as well. So I just want to share this clip or this, this very brief excerpt, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about what this chapter is all about, if I can find it. All right, if any of you know Kiel Mashevsky, I was just talking to him about this uh, last week as well. So I said, these days I find myself in places I've been an awful lot, places like Times Square or the National Mall. And I realized that when I'm there with students, I don't so much take in my surroundings as I do take in them taking it in for the first time. To watch and listen to students react to every little thing. To spend time with kids you love and respect who are excited about using a subway, uh, who are in awe of Central Park, who can't believe they're standing in front of the White House. To watch their faces light up and hear their comments. Man, there's nothing like it. I'm sure my editor cut the word man out of there. <laughs> and being with them in places of memory museums that perfectly complement the study from your classes, the journey that you're on together. I've come to think that this is in large part what being an educator is all about. I end with, you can do this, you truly can, and it will greatly enrich not only your students' lives, but also your own. So I'm sure you can tell that that chapter is, uh, it's a fairly long one, and um, it's about field trips, essentially. It's about experiential learning, which I'll be entering my 18th year of teaching. And I have just grown increasingly passionate about experiential learning, about taking students places that they can't take themselves. You know, these, at 15, you can't book your own flight. Um, at 40, not only can I book your flight in your hotels, and, and use my experience to create a really meaningful trip and itinerary, you know, but I also have the wherewithal to do things like write grant proposals. And, and we here in Omaha have some really amazing people, some really generous organizations. Um, and, and very frequently when I wanna take a group of young people to New York or DC, I can reach out to them and, and they are so kind and, you know, and, and help make it happen so that my students can actually afford to go. Um, one of my, I'm a cross country coach and one of my runner's little sister was asked to go with her school to New York City for four days. And um, she said, how much does that trip cost that you take? And I said, well, this year students paid $250. Now, you know, for four nights in New York, staying in Times Square and being all over the place, that's astronomically low. On the other hand, $250 is an awful lot of money to someone if you're 
making minimum wage or, or even if you're not, you know, I mean, I, I wouldn't pass up on $250 and I make way over minimum wage. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really great that, that we have these incredible organizations that, that help with this, but where I come in, right, is that I can write those grant proposals. Um, it probably isn't going to occur to a 15 year old to write a grant proposal. They may not get it, you know, I, seems unlikely anyway I don't know maybe <laughs> I don't want to sell them short but you know there's so much that we can do um, as, as teachers but also just as adults to help kids have these experiences and so one of the things I'm going to talk about in my talk tomorrow is because I'm speaking exclusively to teachers in England is making sure that we help kids get to these places and have these experiences and you know for me, I, I've taken them to New York and Rwanda, uh, pardon me, New York and Washington, D.C. And, and Kansas City and Chicago many, many, many times, more than I can count. One year I took, took I think, 12 trips to Washington, D.C. with students. Um, this summer, I'm going to take them to Rwanda. Not this summer, next summer. I'm taking former students to Rwanda. I'm, or I'm working on that anyway, and I think we're going to get there. Um, but we can also, from where I teach at Omaha North, I, you know, I have a 90 minute block. And so when we read the autobiography of Malcolm X, we can also step outside. And, and I have to fill out way too much paperwork for what we're doing. But again, that's where I come in as the teacher and the adult, I fill out the paperwork, we step outside, we walk half a mile and we're at the birthplace of Malcolm X and can, can tour that facility and learn more about Malcolm X. And what's astonishing with my seniors is that in any given class of 30 seniors in high school at Omaha North, many, if not most of whom live in the neighborhood, most of them will not have been there. Uh, some of them will not know that it is there until we go, right? And, and that's not because they're ignorant. That's not because of any fault of their own. Um, you know, there are just so many things in the world we don't know, right? But as a teacher who does know that, it's really easy for me to get them over there. Um, it's not much more difficult for me to take them to Bethel Synagogue. It's not much more difficult. I take my world religions class to the Hindu temple of Omaha, which the universal response to that is, wow, I didn't know this was here. You know, it's one block north of Center Street and it is one of the most stunning pieces of architecture in the entire city, but most of us don't know it's there, right? Uh, and so the chance to take my students there and they can tour and learn about it is just extraordinary. But it's something that everybody on this call has the wherewithal to do. And so I devoted an entire chapter to that, just making sure that we help young people have these experiences and, and uh, hopefully maybe plant, plant a seed and nourish a little love of travel um, that, that hopefully, you know, stays with them. So those are just three little clips out of... Uh, out of the book. Um, and, and as I mentioned, I can talk forever. So I'm going to make it a point to stop as much as, as, much as there is more I'd like to say. Um, and I, I could be honored if you had questions, I'd love to, to take them. So thank you. We have such a nice intimate group today. I would just invite you to take yourself off mute and ask your question. But if you feel more comfortable sticking it in the chat, I'll feed it to Mark. I'll, I'll, I'll try. Um, as a, an educator of a different type, I'm a, I'm a filmmaker and journalist. I've spent uh, the last 12 years working um, at Sobibor in Poland. Uh, and I am at a point where I'm, I'm listening to what you have to say and I'm really interested because you're talking about images and film, what to use, what not to use. So the work that I've done is with an archeological team. They, if, I assume that some of you are familiar with Sobibor, but there's nothing there but a forest. These are archeological excavations and the, the lessons from Sobibor are objects, are found objects that are the outcome of the violent bigotry that occurred there. So the question is, when it comes to using film in your classroom, how, does, how would that play 
how would that be a useful tool? Or what would you do if you had materials available to you that were going to be in a different form? How would that become meaningful for your students? Can you tell me a little more, Gary, about materials in a different form? Okay, so material. So I'll give you a couple of quick examples. Uh, very first year that excavations were done, we found a ring of keys, then another key and another key. Uh, we were searching for the foundations of the gas chambers and the whole place had been destroyed after a revolt that occurred in 1943. The Nazis raised the place. There's now a force covering the place. So when you find keys and you're looking for traces of the, the gas chambers, you're as, as, a, as the scientists and historians that were there were looking at these and assumed that the keys were to, were to lock something at the gas chamber. But it, what eventually became obvious, more obvious is when more and more keys were, were found, they couldn't be to lock something up at that site. They were actually keys belonging to the people who had been deceived by, by the Nazis to come and take a shower. And they brought with them the keys to their uh, luggage. And when they died and their bodies were dragged out, the keys were strewn about an area. Now, for me, this is testimony from people without voices. A lot of the objects are fairly common objects, but they're found in a forest. They're found in a place where they shouldn't be found. There are eyeglasses, there's a Judaica, there's a, um, uh, I've forgotten the, I can't believe I've forgotten this, but uh, a prayer. Um, um, there are horrible things that are found there as well. But the question is, is how do you take film and apply it for critical thinking because the, the story of the items that are found are as much about a deception perpetrated by the Nazis um, and deceiving the people who arrived in part to make it that they wouldn't, um, there wouldn't be a chaotic scene. I mean, it's a, it's a really devious use of what happened and how people were treated and right. how a young person can understand that this is the outcome of desensitizing the people who were running this place and the people who lived in the area, not knowing about it. That, that one, I would, I would, I'll push back on them not knowing about it, um, but I'll do that another time and answer the question. Yeah, you so I don't mean it that, I, I, yeah, it's, it's a different form of not knowing because it's in the middle of the woods. Obviously the people in the area knew, knew what was happening. So um, I, I guess what I'm, the thing that jumps out at me right away that I think is really important, there's a chapter in my book that either is or was called Auschwitz comma and, which is a phrase I use a lot. Um, because I think that because of so many, you know, there, there are two, two fundamental reasons why Auschwitz has become the center of the narrative. The first is that it, it had a hybrid status, right? It, it was massive, but it was also not exclusively a killing center. It had a killing center, but there was a labor component and a concentration component. Um, and so it's, it's, um, it's not Zobibor. In other words, it's not hell no, it's not Maidanic um, in that way. Uh, but the other is that we have an absolute canon of work from prolific writers that came out of Auschwitz. Uh, you know, Victor Frankl and, and Elie Wiesel and Primo Levi and many, many, many more. And so Auschwitz frequently becomes the beginning and the end when teachers have a very short period of time, right? I'm going to teach night. Well, Night is 110 pages long and 80 some of those take place in Auschwitz. Um, and so that is not a great unit on the Holocaust. It's, it's the most powerful book I've ever read. It's not a great unit on the Holocaust. If you can incorporate something from Zobibor, right? We know, we know quite a bit about Auschwitz and the manipulations that were used, um, you know, numbering coat hooks and telling people to remember where their belongings were. And, 
write your name on your luggage and, and um, Arbeit macht frei and any number of other things used to manipulate people. Um, right, if you can say, if you can, can, can juxtapose that next to, for example, Zobibor um, and point out that, right, that in, in a similar fashion, people were told to hang on to the keys to their belongings. You know, I think you've got a number of people on this call who, who are very talented and who could probably write some pretty good curriculum on that. Um, I'm sure they could write lessons I would be eager to use. Um, but I think that, that what that does maybe uh, is add depth and complexity uh, to, to existing units probably, because I don't think, in, in fact, I know that um, outside of Auschwitz, the death camps are not widely taught. That the fact that they existed is taught um, and Auschwitz is taught, um, but you know, Maidanic, not so much. And so this would be, I think, perhaps an opportunity. Thanks. Sure, sure. Thanks, Gary. Any more questions before I jump in? I, okay. I have a question. Um, Something that's been bothering me a lot lately has been the phenomena of um, feeling safer by blaming the victims. Mm. And um, I mean, it's happening now with victims of crime. You know, why were you out at 3 a.m.? Why were you out at 1? Why did you leave your car unlocked? Why did you lock your car? Um, why did you hang out with these people? Why did you make these choices? Anyway, but as far as the Holocaust, there's phrases like, um, I wouldn't just get on the train. And I feel like now I hear people thinking that they could outsmart the Nazis and they would have if they lived back then. But people didn't have choices. People were smart. Nazis were smart and Jews were smart. But um, there were so many ways that Nazis had to uh, get all the Jews turned in, you know, like no place to hide, you know, like if families tried to hide them, they would line up the families and shoot all of them as an example. Um, do you talk to your students about this? And, you know, not the danger of thinking that you could outsmart someone and the judgmentalism involved in thinking that maybe Jews weren't that smart. <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> fortunately, that is, not, you know, yes, I do. I address this with my students and I also address it on some level in the book, you know, and, and it's, it's tricky, right? Because you do, I, I think that my colleagues who teach younger students deal with this a little more than I do with my juniors and seniors in high school, especially maybe in, in honors classes who are, are you know, um, maybe used to, to thinking a little higher and, and uh, feeling a little deeper, if it, as it were. Um, you know, the, the whole idea, I, I frequently hear, well, if, if they came to get me, you know, I don't frequently hear this in my classes, but teachers have told me they hear, well, if they came to get me, I'd shoot them. You know, like, do you answer the door with a gun in your hand? And if not, shut up. And if so, stop doing that. You know, like, I mean, it's just such nonsense. Um, and, and I think most young people can be led to see that pretty quickly. You know, um, I do, I, we have contingents in this country and we wind up with contingents of, you know, uh, of, thereby of our students, you know, I, I, had a, I had a young person tell me one time, well, every time somebody my dad doesn't like gets elected, he buys another AR-15. I, I, you know, that horrifies me, but I'm like, I just asked him, I said, how many can he shoot at one time? You know, how many arms has your father got? Like, what's the point here? Um, but I think one of the things that we did really well at, when I worked at the Holocaust Museum was to really try to drive home for teachers the idea that we needed to avoid simple answers to complex questions. 
and one of the most effective ways I've got of, of, of addressing one of those questions comes up in the book. And I share the story of Miriam Klein Kasanoff, who's still alive. She's a survivor and, and works down in Florida. And we email very regularly. She's, she's in a group that I study with about once a month. Oh, not well, please give her my best or I'll do that for you. But uh, you know, Sandy and I met her together and and um, Miriam's a lot, if you don't know her. She is, she is, she is at least three people's personality in one. And, and honestly, that over the years, I've just come to love that. Um, but she told this incredible story when we met her back in like 2006 or seven, whenever this was that we were out there, Sandy, um, about her family escaping. And I, I spent hours watching video testimony of her and interviewing her to put together like a page and a half for my book. Um, and I, you know, I'd send it back to her and I'd say, Miriam, did I get this right? Did I get this right? And, and she'd say, well, no, not quite here and so forth, but we got it. We eventually got it where she went, yep, that's right. And it's the story of her father, also a rabbi mm -hmm. and uh, taking her family out of Europe. Right. And, and to make this really quick, they had to travel through six countries uh, or possibly seven and to get to the United States. Right. And to get into the United States, you had, you know, they ultimately they had to make their way to Portugal so that they could get on a boat. They missed the boat. Their entry visas expired. Right. Six countries is six languages, six different translators, all of this, you know, 80 years before email and well not 80 but 60 whatever it is right like and none of this is being done electronically they were mailing documents stamping things her father the rabbi maurice is standing in line every day he gets super lucky running into a german who's not a nazi sympathizer who's on vacation who helps him translate some documents uh into portuguese and i mean it's just nuts and and Using this story, and I, I also, and, and I think every teacher should, but uh, this is a judgment. I have a 14-foot floor-to-ceiling, wall-to-wall map of the world on my back wall. And to quote one of my colleagues, I don't know how anybody teaches anything without a map of the world on the wall. Um, it, it's just the most useful thing I've got. If I get one prop, it's a map. And so I'll go back and we'll trace that journey, you know, using what Miriam and I wrote together about her story with my students through these different countries. And very quickly, the question, one of, the, one of those common questions that's frankly sort of silly, right, is why didn't they just leave? And, and in five minutes, you give me a map and Miriam's story, and in five minutes, the question becomes, how did so many people get out? How is it possible so many people got out? And I think that that also uh, maybe exemplifies the idea, right, of thinking a little higher about these topics. So. Darlene popped a question in the chat, Mark, about whether you took your students to the Samuel Bach exhibit, and if so, how did you prepare them? Wow. Um, yes. So yes, that was such a neat exhibit. And if anybody does, I suspect, I'm, I'm, I know I'm in very good company right now. So I suspect you all know that actually there's a whole Samuel Bach Museum opening up there on campus. Um, and I just couldn't be more excited about that and, and getting students in there. Um, but, but yes, I did. And uh, your question is about preparation, which I think is always so important, right? Like, can you just walk into the Holocaust Museum with a vague idea of what the Holocaust was and learn things? Definitely. Uh, is that the most effective way to do that? Definitely not. And so to prep for uh, the Bach exhibit, uh, first, uh, so Mark Selensack runs that program at UNO and he had produced these incredible um, booklets of some of Bach's work. And so if, it, if any of you are, not familiar, Samuel Bach is a survivor. I, I believe he lives in Boston currently um, and, and became a, an, inc he's an incredible artist. He's a painter. I, he may also sculpt, but he's primarily a painter. And, and, and his, his work is largely to do with the Holocaust, but contains an awful lot of themes. And so, uh, for example, pears are one of them. And uh, 
you know, I think if you don't have any context, you're like, what is this dude's obsession with pears? Um, and so that book did a really nice job of, of uh, kind of walking us through some of those themes and, and um, uh, box life uh, leading up to this. I actually kind of have it in my head after the museum opens that taking students on a journey that would include traveling back to Europe and kind of retracing some of his steps would be a really neat thing to do. But yeah, uh, that, that book was very effective. We looked at some of his other work online and, and I think, you know, uh, importantly, we looked at um, the, the, uh, the, the, the themes in the work and, and why he was doing what he was doing. And, and the other thing that was convenient is we'd been studying the Holocaust for, for almost two months when my students went to the exhibit, which was great that they had that level of background, so. Um, anything else? I'm doing my patient teacher wait time before I ask my question. But now I'm just gonna pop right in. Although Beth took herself off mute. Go Beth, go. <laughs> I saw that. I'm just interested in what your personal expectations and hopes are for your book. Ah, uh, um, you know, I mean, again, to be honest, I, I kind of, it, I wrote it, I wrote it the way I wanted to write it, expecting it to be rejected and that didn't happen. So on some level we have exceeded expectations. It was published by Teachers College Press and I'm elated by that or it will be. Um, but I, I suppose the other thing I told Scott on the phone the other day, I said, uh, I, I would love to follow this up with a similar book about teaching about Rwanda. I worked in Rwanda for seven years and um, I teach about Rwanda as well in my class on 20th century genocide. And when I said to Scott, I said, the only way they'll publish that book is if this one sells. So <laughs> on some level, I would like to see an awful lot of people buy this book. You know, I, I don't expect a uh, classroom teacher's guide to the Holocaust to become a New York Times bestseller, but um, I hope it does well enough for Teachers College Press that when I say I'd like to do a book on teaching about Rwanda, they say, that sounds like a great idea. Um, on a more personal note, just really quickly, I think 10 years ago, maybe more than 10 years ago now, it was a long time ago, I wrote a book that none of you have ever read or seen called uh, Accessing Darfur. I'm in my home office. Let's see. Um, I wrote this many, many, many years ago about teaching about Darfur. Um, and it was published by my first publisher who was a guy with uh, a computer in his basement, bless him. I was so grateful that he was willing to publish it. But I frequently tell my students this story. For whatever reason, I was convinced that this magnum opus of mine was going to be the final nail in the coffin of that genocide. I thought that as soon as teachers had something at their disposal that quickly and concisely said, this is how we teach about this, that, that this army of educators would impart enough knowledge onto, onto students about the genocide in Darfur that there would be this massive uprising. Um, and I could go on and on and on about my naivete if you'd like me to, but clearly that isn't what happened. And so, you know, the, the joke that Holocaust historians sometimes tell about Mein Kampf is that it was very much like the Bible in Germany, everybody had a copy, nobody read it. And so I think my hope for this book is that people will read it. I wrote it, I wrote it in such a way that I hope that people would, would read it and maybe even enjoy reading it and hopefully find something useful in it. Well, before I pop Holly's um, question to you, I wanna thank you for not writing it <clears throat> in academic ease. <laughs> because while I can read and process that, it takes me twice as long. Um, so I think I'm going to enjoy the first person. So thank you for that. Holly um, is asking about your advice to high schools experiencing anti-Semitism. I'm not sure, Holly, are you talking about the schools in general, like the administration and teachers or students, high school students themselves? Um, it appears to be coming from both places. In some of our high schools here, it's very uh, disconcerting. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so I'll say two things, and I'm going to try to be uncharacteristically brief. The first is that I don't think there is a high school out there that is not experiencing anti-Semitism. It may be that the student, that there is, you know, in, in a small school, like, you know, I, I graduated with 64 people. It's possible there were no Jewish students at my school. If there were Jewish students at my school in Valentine, Nebraska, uh, I was unaware of them. Um, that doesn't mean that there wasn't anti-Semitism. And I think that, you know, this, this oldest hatred is a rampant problem across our country, whether it is, you know, in, in so many different forms. And so you asked about advice and, and my advice would be don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, the advice to teachers would be don't, you don't have to do this yourself. We have the ADL, we have the IHE. We have so many incredible resources at our disposal. I know that if you call Scott, Kale, Alan Potash, so many other people, you know, they'll take that call, they'll listen to what you're saying, and then they'll help you figure out how to go forward from there. Um, and I, I do think that sometimes as a teacher, especially a teacher maybe who, you know, if, if, you, t if you teach about the Holocaust and you're one of one or two teachers who does, then suddenly, right, you, you get pigeonholed here and people say, okay, well, uh, somebody drew a swastika in the bathroom. What are we going to do about this? And I think that the most reasonable response I can think of is to go, I don't know. Let's call the ADL, right? Let's take it seriously and let's get real help. Let's not, you know, let's address this. And, and frankly, to my point about, I think there being anti-Semitism in every school in America, um, you know, I think, that, and, and beyond, well beyond America, by the way. Um, you know, I think that uh, being proactive is a really great idea as well. Let's not wait for the vandalism in the bathroom. Let's not wait for the incident to occur. Let's address it now. That is the goal. That is the goal. Although we have been very busy this year, um, both the ADL and, and the IHE with that very thing. Um, but many times it's been very rewarding on both ends, which is good news. Um, if you have time for one more question before oh, we- I'm loving okay. it. And may I ask a question real quick? Sure. I'm really bad at this stuff. Um, and I'm, I've been told I have to get good at it quickly. Is there any, may I take a picture of this group that I would then like tweet at my publisher or something? Is yes. that okay? If, if you're like, no, don't photograph me. Do you mind just like, Turning your camera off. <laughs> the camera off for a second. You'll, you'll see me do this. So um, I just, I appreciate that. I've, uh, like, you're not a very good self promoter. And I'm like, you know, I know you'd think I'd be better, but um, <laughs> so. Yeah, there you can see me. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Way to think about it. I always, you know, I was supposed to do that for a week of understanding too. And I would, I would just get so engrossed in what I was doing, I would forget every time. Yeah, yeah. Um, Can I ask a question, please? Absolutely. Okay, I am not a teacher, but I consider myself in many ways an educator because I'm a Holocaust survivor who tells my story over and over again. And many, many times I get the question, what can my generation do to prevent it from happening again? And I tell the kids to speak out and stand up for the kids who were being picked on and uh, don't let anybody deny there's a Holocaust. There was a Holocaust because today you met a survivor. But I would like to know if you have a better answer to this question. How can today's generation help prevent another Holocaust. Well, Agnes, first, I'm just so honored you're here. I wanted to be sure I said that. Thank you so much Thank for you. coming. Um, I look forward to seeing you in person again soon. I don't have a better answer, but I might add a few things that okay. I've said that might be helpful. Um, one of them, I was a basketball coach for 17 years. Mm -hmm. And one of the most effective basketball coaches ever 
is a man at the University of Connecticut, which incidentally has an excellent Holocaust education program. Um, but uh, they also have extraordinary basketball and their women's basketball coach, Gina Oriema, is probably the best. Um, and coach Oriema always said, he said, you know, he's thinking about practice and drills, think of any, any skill, layup, whatever. He says, don't do it until you get it right. Do it until you can't get it wrong. And as I was talking about in, in a previous chapter that I shared with you, the idea that we can help young people develop a moral compass, um, you know, it, it's not something I can force you to do, but I, I don't know how many young people have, have told me, and, and even friends have told me, your approach to the homeless has made me reconsider mine and things of that nature. And you know, I think if we can just give them repetitive opportunities to empathize, to help, you know, to volunteer. High school students, by no fault of their own, get in this really awful habit of racking up 200 volunteer hours their senior year mm -hmm. because they suddenly realized that, that was good resume material. But every now and again, I'll meet one who's got 200 hours or more you know, or, or less, it doesn't matter, accrued over 10 years mm -hmm. because that's who they are, right? Because that's what they want to do with their time. And someone opened that door early. Someone said, well, hey, why don't we just spend Saturday mornings here at the food pantry? And they realized they liked it. And three hours once a month just became a part of their life, you know? And so I think that repetitively doing the right thing and i know we can argue about what the right thing is but i think there's also some common ground that we can agree upon repetitively doing the right thing i think is important and the other thing and i will attempt not to get too terribly political i'm sworn off politics for the near future but um our system I, I, I actually said this at cross country practice this morning. I hope nobody uh, holds this too much against me. But I said, you know, one of, one of my students, these, these are young people exploring the world. And one of them said, what do you think about communism? And I said, I don't think democracy is broken enough for me to want to try it yet. I said, although every time Marjorie Taylor Greene opens her mouth, it does make me question. Yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. The democracy, because real human beings with the right to vote picked her over, I don't even know who she ran against, but I mean, a rock would be a superior representative. And I'm just <laughs> astonished. And so one of the things I really try to push young people to do is to be involved in politics. And if you don't know, I ran for office and as a candidate, I was very careful not to do anything that seemed self-serving, but I am no longer a candidate. And I'm really excited to get back into the classroom and, and continue to push and push and push. You know, it's not, it's not, I voted, cool. No, vote, comma, and, right? What else can we do? Whose ideals and, and beliefs and, and morals match your own? And how can you get them into office? And what offices do what, right? We don't have an involved electorate. We know that. And I think that if we can get young people involved in the system, um, understanding how it works and wanting to be part of it, we might still be able to save it. No promises, but it's possible. <laughs> well, white supremacy really scares me because it reminds me of the Nazis. And well, thank you for adding to my comments. Uh, I will incorporate what you said, and I appreciate your help. Thank you. I and appreciate everything you do. <laughs> Thank you. Very important to me that it never happens again. Well, and, and the fact that you mentioned that your world religions class is in jeopardy and your Holocaust yeah. literature class may be in jeopardy, um, sure. and just the, the diminishment of the humanities in general, even at the higher ed level, um, I think that is not coincidental no, either. No, I don't think so. You know, and those are the exact places where those, that moral muscle can be built. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, 
and an interesting part of that, just as we're thinking about politics and education and being involved, I was asked uh, if I would be interested in directing the school play next year. And I said, we have a theater program. And the response was not anymore. We have a school of more than 2,000 oh. students and we just axed our entire theater program. Um, it's, it's astonishing. And it, it was very under the radar. I, I don't actually know if I'm supposed to repeat that. I was not told not to repeat it, so I don't think I violated any confidences, but it's gone. The theater director left. Uh, is very unlikely to be replaced. And so, and, and that's, I, I think we're only gonna see more of that. And uh, I know what theater did for me as a student. I know what the arts did for me. And, and so we have a lot of work to do. Well, I don't think it's coincidental that it is the humanities that are being squeezed to the margins and being cut underneath the radar. Right. Um, and there's many reasons for that. I was not gonna ask my question because Agnes's was so good, but I would, I really do the, because we are talking about the humanities, we're talking about paradox, right? This, and we don't do that well as Americans. We do not do the both and holding to opposing truths easily. We like certainty and we like easy answers. And so this idea of, of Holocaust pedagogy, not ped, pedagogy, not finding simple answers to complex questions. I wanted to ask you about critical thinking because you've mentioned it several times. We see it in the news almost every day in some way, shape or form these days. And that meaning means, that means different things to different people. So could you tell us what that means to you and how you develop that? I mean, this is, in five minutes or less, please, Dr. Gudgel, could you please tell us <laughs> how you develop critical thinking in your students? Just give us a elevator speech. I'm really tempted just to say to you, think higher, feel deeper. <laughs> Drop the mic as my uh, mentor did so long ago. You would be perfectly justified because that is a loaded question. But maybe just tell us what it means to you not how you develop it in your students, but we see this, we're seeing this term in the news all the time. Yeah, well, I would say the simplest answer that I, the shortest answer I can think to, to share in developing critical thinking is providing opportunities to do so. Um, there is a huge difference, right? I know, and I know I mentioned it earlier, which is the only reason I bring it up. I know that the Vonsay Conference happened on January the 20th, 1942. I don't think knowing that date is important. I've just taught about it long enough that I can't forget it. I do think knowing why the meeting was held on that day, uh, who was there, not necessarily even by name, but what they represented, you know, their names are frankly forgettable and that's fine. But why were they there, right? Why, why was the representative of Hans Frank, the governor of Poland, uh, present at that meeting? Why did he need to be there very specifically? It was very yeah. important that Bueller was at that meeting. The head of the Gestapo was at that meeting. Uh, Kritzinger, who was a uh, ministry official, was present at that. Why were they there? And every bit as, if not more important, why wasn't Hitler there? This thing took place in Berlin. The guy was 25 kilometers away. This is one of the most important things that ever happened, except that we almost didn't know it happened because they created 30 copies of the minutes and destroyed all but one. Had Martin Luther not probably forgot to destroy it. I don't know. I don't know if there are other theories. I don't think he was being an anti-Nazi rebel. You know, he did end up imprisoned in Saxon housing concentration camp for conspiring against his superiors. But I do not think that he kept that copy of those minutes because he was, you know, trying to maintain them for history. I, I, I just don't think that. Um, but had he not kept that and had someone digging through mountains of paperwork, not found it and gone, wait a minute, if you sub out these euphemisms, if you sub out material for the resettlement of Jews with Zyklon B, if you sub out final solution to the Jewish question with, you know, 
what it really means. This is actually quite the blueprint we've got here, right? And then had Eichmann not been captured and gone on trial and been able to speak to this uh, and, and fill in some blanks for us, we may never have even known that this happened, right? The date is unimportant, save for the fact that it is interesting that it was pushed back because of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Um, you know, from an American standpoint, that's fascinating and helps students to remember it and keep items in order, you know. But I think giving them the opportunity, you know, to forget the date, I don't test. Maybe, maybe that's a better answer to this question. I don't give tests ever. Um, I was doing some postdoc research at Harvard University and I was in a room full of arguably pretty smart people. And we were studying Galtung's theory of uh, peace and violence and his frameworks for peace and violence. And we were asked to give examples of direct violence. And that's like, you know, physical violence. That, that could be berating somebody, but that could be hitting somebody, murder, war. This is all direct violence. That was pretty easy. And then we were asked to give examples of structural violence. And no hesitation, a teacher across the table did that thing our students do where she raised her hand, but then didn't wait to be called on. And she says, standardized testing. And we all started laughing, 40 teachers from around the country. And then that laughter died quickly as we realized that that was about the best example of structural violence any of us could come up with. Uh, my son Titus is about to turn six. My daughter Zoe is four. I hope I've killed the ACT by the time they're old enough to take it. If not, I'll probably excuse them from it. But if my son tells me, dad, I need to take the SAT because I wanna go to Yale. And by the way, I'm a Harvard guy. So I'll be like, you're not going to Yale. But you know, if that's his goal for whatever reason, I'll be like, okay, well, then I guess you can take the SAT. I'm not gonna get in his way. But here's the problem, right? My son can take that test as many times as he wants to because I have the means to pay for it over and over and over again. And if we find out that math is a shortcoming, which I would only assume would be genetic, then I can hire him a tutor, um, you know, and, I, and we can pay that tutor for, for hours. We can do this for years. And when he's testing, right, I can stay home. I can, I can make sure he gets a good night's sleep. I can wake him up in the morning, make him his favorite breakfast, get him there on time. I can do everything that we know helps people succeed on these exams. And at the end of the day, he's going to be competing against some kid who had to work a, a 2 a.m. shift at the gas station because mom's minimum wage job doesn't keep the lights on. And that kid almost overslept. So they skipped breakfast and they get there stressed out. They never had a tutor and they have been saving for six months to take this test. And this is their one shot. And they're gonna sit in the seat across from my son. It's a mess. And if we as educators and people, stakeholders in education can steer people away from testing towards projects, collaborative group work, conversations, essays, the ability to articulate yourself, you know, I think that is the best way to build critical thinking skills is to create an environment in which they are constantly in practice. Just, just Socratic seminar all day, every day, you know? Well, Harriet just sent me um, a, a question, whether you ever receive resistance from the administration about the films you show. I'm gonna expand that and say, do you ever get any resistance from your administration? Period, question mark. Uh, <laughs> I generally speaking, I love John Lewis, but I am not much of a troublemaker, not even good trouble. Um, I have found myself very comfortable under the radar if I'm able to stay there. And uh, so it does happen on occasion. Um, I think that my environment uh, at Omaha North is conducive to my belief system, honestly. Um, I taught lessons last year in privilege I taught about privilege. I used myself as an example. I tried to be gentle and compassionate in talking about it. You know, I said, look, we'll use me as the example. I'm the, 
poster child for privilege. I have two educated parents who are still married to each other who could study with me, right? I'm, I'm white, I'm male, I'm cisgendered, I'm heterosexual. We could go on and on and on, but I, I am the poster child for privilege and I'll own it for the purpose of this conversation, right? Um, I had, uh, I have 200 students approximately. I taught that lesson in every class I teach. I had one uh, angry email, one angry phone call, and one kid show up with a Confederate flag mask on and drop my class. Um, and I'm sorry that I lost him, you know, because I suspect that, that uh, maybe, maybe, I don't, don't want to sound too pompous, but maybe I could have helped him because if you're wearing a Confederate flag on your face and it doesn't embarrass the hell out of you, that's a problem. But um, very rarely do I get that pushback. I do. You know, and I've had admin call me and go, what, what's going on? Why, you know, why did I get this parent phone call? But my admin is so great when I say, you know, here's what happened. They're like, oh, okay, well, thank you. Carry on, you know, <laughs> so, um, but I don't think, I've taught in other places where I don't think that would have been the response. I'll say that. Well, that is a perfect segue into next week's third Thursday. So before I thank you, um, because we're talking about critical next thinking. Month, what? Week. We'd love to do it next week, but it's going to be next month. Did I said ne next week? Yeah, just um, wanted to clarify. Well, it's this week, and that, and you know why. Um, but we're we're next month, next third Thursday. We're talking about a book called "Learning from the Germans: Race and the Memory of Evil," which is Susan Neiman's book. And so, talking about critical thinking and making connections, Holocaust education and Confederate flags. The first part of this book is about how Germany is working off the past of the Holocaust. And the second half of this book is all about Mississippi. So there is the connection. So I would, you do not have to read the book. I will be sending out um, some, some blurbs and things if you haven't read the book, but I do highly recommend you read it because boy, is it pertinent to uh, the cultural and political conversations that are being had today. But that's next month on uh, July 15th. But Mark, thank you so much for this. I'm really looking forward to getting my hands on your book. You. Um, and I know that there have been some other people in the chat who are um, looking forward to that too. So as soon as we have information, we will make sure we get that out. It was such a pleasure to have you here and have you here with Sandy and with Beth that you've worked so closely with for so long and gone on trips to DC and, and have so much in common with Rwanda. It's been a real privilege. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Thank you all for being here. Please, uh, anybody who'd like to reach out if you wanna, uh, I, I have not been attentive to the chat, I apologize, but I, if you don't have my phone number or my email, uh, anyone who has it is welcome to share it and I'd love to hear from you. And anybody who needs it, please feel free to email us and we can pass it along. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Agnes. It's good to see you. Good to see you, Beth.